Software patents. So who is worried about software patents? Uh, okay, who is not worried about software patents? Because the non-programmers can leave the room. I read yesterday that Microsoft had to pay $1.5 billion for some patents on some maths, apparently, which is very interesting. Um, in America, software patents have been a fact of life since about 1985. Small, first of all, and then. Now, I think one million pending patents, of which a large number have something to do with software. In Europe, it's still quite complex. So I want to explain today for the software developers here how software patents um, could affect you, how they, how they exist uh, legally, and what we as an association are doing about them. So if, if you don't know who I am, I'm Peter Hinchens. I'm the president of the FFII. We're an association in Europe and a bit further abroad that have been working against software patents and for open standards and for copyright for about seven years. We were founded in 99 in Munich and now we're in about 20 countries, 1,000 members. And what we do is we try to help our politicians gently to define laws which work better for our industry, which is programmer software. I'm a free software developer. I've been writing software since I was about well, 17, actually, but that's a long time ago. And free software since 91, 92. What Europe has been doing basically is trying to imitate America. And I, I like the story of the, the guy jumping off the very tall building and he's falling down, falling down. He's saying, so far, so good, so far, so good, so far, so good. And this is Europe with software patents. We have in each country a fairly healthy approach to, to patents. When the European Patent Convention was built in the 70s, national parliaments decided quite carefully that software arts, maths, were not inventions to be patented. These were creative works well covered by copyright. And this was what the European Patent Convention defined. And the national, each country in Europe has this, still this, this uh, point of view. There was a case in the UK, for example, a few months ago, where the High Court said, look, this, this is software, it can't be patented. It's a, still an enshrined notion. But the EPO, which is this patent office outside the EU, has been since 85 systematically changing the rules to allow patents on software. And it's, it's a delicate process. It, it's taken them about 15 years. And with five steps each time changing one thing, they come to the point where now if you take a program and go to Munich and say, I want to patent this program, they'll give you a, a patent. And it's also on business methods. It's on ways of selling drugs. It's on ways of doing things. And the EPO still thinks, you know, we, we should be like America. You know, Europe is, is like the poor cousin of the rich Americans, and we should be like America. It's their dream. One million pending patents. But the problem in America is that the system has gone completely crazy. It's falling apart. Um, and the American economy isn't doing so well either. Um, Europe is actually growing faster than the States. And people are seriously starting to wonder whether the patent system isn't really one of the big problems in America. When you, I mean, who here likes Microsoft? Okay, it's a fair bet. They're a software company, but when they pay $1.5 billion because they've been selling some MP3 software, they've been distributing it, I find that offensive. I don't care who they are. I find that a company like Lucent, who don't make any MP3 products, didn't invent it, didn't develop it, are basically charging someone a tax for using maths. The effects of patenting, over-patenting, are, are they're insidious. They stop people from doing things. It's not just in software. It's in health. For example, research into malaria, which is a disease that affects something like 100 million people and, and is a really bad disease. The research into malaria is stopped, slowed down, blocked, because some companies own patents on some of the malaria parasites. So if you research, you're actually violating a patent. You're using information which is not public anymore. And this is little by little turning what was and what we expect to be a public, common 
goods, you know, what we know, what we, what we build, what we invent as a community, as a, as a world, into private property in the name of profits. And the argument, it's a simple argument, it's a very childish argument, is that you know, the market is always right and profits are always good and anything you can sell and buy is a good thing, you know, it makes money for someone. But this is, it's very 1990s, you know, it's old. The example I give my wife is, it's good to be able to own a house, that's nice. It means that you can you know, be owner of your house, you can you know, fix the roof and you won't get thrown out the next day by some landlord. But it would be really silly to sell off the streets. And some forms of property can be private, but some have to be shared, otherwise they, you know, the, the, the market we live in falls apart. Okay. So in Europe you have a few large companies, mostly Microsoft, SAP, Siemens, Nokia, Philips, who have been pushing very aggressively over the last years for software patents and basically trying to find any avenue they can to get what they see as a, you know, an essential tool for business and what everyone else sees as a insanity. In 2005, the FFII fought and finished a, a very long battle. It began in about 2000, where there was an attempt to get a new directive through the parliament which would have once and for all legalized software patents. This was a very, uh, a very divisive fight. It split the IT industry in two. You had a very visible you know, fragmentation. Some companies really wanting software patents and some companies really against them. I think everyone, every individ individual programmer, every free software developer very clearly understood the dangers. We got a lot of support from politicians and we basically stopped the, the, the EPOs and, and, and I would say big software's plans in, in Europe at that point. So, of course, you know, this is not a, uh, a simple game and with 15 years of developing software patents in Europe, there are many other ways of doing it. The current attempt, the current strategy is to basically bypass the European Union, bypass Parliament, and build a new patent court which would be outside Europe. So in, in Europe, if you're, if you're the EPO, if you're you know, a, a pro software patent specialist, usually you know, people who buy and sell software patents and patents in general, then if you look at the current situation, there's two big problems. One is these national courts, which don't like software patents and never have liked them. The second is the European Parliament, which has proven that it's able to stand up to you know, bullying and actually say, no, go away. So the, the big plan and the big danger right now is this new proposal which would bypass the European Parliament and would bypass national courts. It's called the EPLA, you may have heard of it, European Patent Litigation Agreement. And what this means, it's an agreement which would be signed by a number of countries and it would basically say when you have a patent lawsuit, you don't go to national court anymore. You go to this new court, which is very powerful and can, can you know, you can sue anyone in Europe for any amount of money for doing anything. It's lovely. It's a dream. What it would mean if EPLA gets signed is that all the software patents which are sitting in the EPO, the kind of, you know, in a state of limbo, they've, they've been granted, they've been examined, they've been not opposed, they've been paid for, they're, they're valid in quotes, they're valid at the, the global level, um, world patents, but they're not valid in Belgium, in, in France, in Germany, in the UK. They might be if you go to court and you really fight for them, but they're in limbo. And there are something like, I don't know, 100,000 of these patents. If the EPLA gets signed by, let's say, you know, a core group of, 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 of European member countries, suddenly all of these patents become valid in those countries, and valid as in court. So it's a, it's a lovely setup. Of course, it's not that simple. I mean, people, there are people who really despise the, the EPLA and find this an offensive thing. Um, it's very anti-European, for one thing. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a European, I'm half Scottish, half Belgian, I live in Brussels. So I kind of like the idea of Europe because we Scots, we always felt like an oppressed minority. You know? And when we're in Europe, there are so many oppressed minorities, we feel like a big happy family. <laughs> so, and, you know, we've seen bad governments in the past. I think what's happening in Brussels isn't perfect, but I think it has a chance of being something quite good. And I would quite like to be, you know, a one day when I'm 70 or 80, be a you know, citizen of the United States of Europe. I think 
with, you know, you know, big macho political power. I think it could be fun. But, it, you know, it's actually going to be a, another 20, 30 years of chaos, and out of this will emerge a functioning parliament, a functioning, you know, two houses, a functioning legal system. And every step on the way is part of that. Now, something like EPLA is outside that. It's, it's anti-European. It says the European system doesn't work. We don't like the parliament. We don't like making laws by proper discussion and proper debate. We want to make our own laws completely outside any democratic process. I know that's a bad thing. There's no way of fixing it. There's no way of getting it you know, under control anymore. You know, if the parliament isn't doing a bad job, and, and we, prove, we proved this last year, two years ago, you go to the parliament, you knock on doors, you tell MEPs, this law's a bad law, and they listen. MEPs have to, at some point, answer to their voters, and I think this is the... The, the cure for many bad laws is to get them into the public debate, get them into the, you know, the political um, arena where they can be discussed and, and looked at. So our goal as FFII, my goal as president of this association, is to bring the discussion of patents into the public arena. It's been done very much under the table. I think, like many, many laws get passed or many legal changes get made by avoiding discussion, you know, all the experts get together and they agree on something, sign some documents, and suddenly there's a new law and no one knows about it. But patents aren't just some accessory thing. They're, they're absolutely essential to our modern economy. You know, why, for example, can I, in Kenya, do a payment on my mobile phone, do a money transfer mobile phone, and why not in, in, in Europe? I mean, you know, Europe invented the GSM standard, so why can't we make it evolve. The reason is patents. It's so heavily patented that there's almost no progress anymore. Just the licenses to get involved, like 110% of, the, of the, the cost. So patents are actually affecting us in every single domain. And the question of how we fix the patent system has to be done, has to be answered by all of us, not by some experts in the room somewhere. So we're launching uh, Three, well, we are in the process of launching or have launched three separate initiatives. This, this EPLA thing, which has been floated for the, couple of years, the last couple of years, is basically causing a lot of confusion, anxiety. It's, the German presidency is pushing it very hard. The French have their own proposal, and the Germans are saying, well, the French can, you know, not very important, we can leave them to have their election, and then when they're finished, we'll come back with our EPLA proposal. And, SAP and Siemens are lobbying very hard, and the whole thing has got very stuck. The Commission doesn't like EPLA. They want their own thing called community patent, which is sitting there quietly. So we have a couple of years, one year, two years, to you know, take some initiative. The first thing that we have done is set up a series of conferences, which we call the European Patent Conference. We had one in Munich last year, one in Brussels this year. We have one more in Brussels in May. And the goal is to get all of these, all the patent expert community, who are not all in favor of software patents, many of them are actually clever and understand that a system which lives for a long time has to be balanced and has to work, it can't just take everything, it has to give back as well. And to bring these people into uh, an event, into a group where they can speak together, exchange information and come up with better ideas. So this is, this is, these events will be taking place all year and we're running them with a um, number of interesting partners. We had, last time we had on the same stage, Greenpeace talking about patents on life and IBM explaining why patents and software were, were bad for open standards. So it's interesting to see how large, even the largest patent holder, software patent holder, IBM, can actually stand up publicly and say, look, there's a problem here. If we, we depend on open standards and software patents make it impossible to make new open standards. So what do we do? We're basically stuck. The second initiative we've done is start a new industry association. So we noticed one thing, which is FFII is mostly individuals. Mostly we're activists, we're mostly software developers, people who have understood the problem. But there was never a real place for, for companies to get involved. And how many people here are, are involved in running a small company? Okay, so 
like me, I, I began a small company because as a professional developer, it's, it's fun to have a little business. If you want to find out, for example, as a small company, how you can get involved in the patent debate, how you can help or how you can get information, or even, even in, in the software domain, who represents you in Brussels? There's nobody. We have national associations here and there. There's no European association, so we've started one. The European Software Market Association, ESOMA. So all of you entrepreneurs can, can join us, and ESOMA will basically help finance what FFII is doing. Help us to lobby, organize events. The third thing that we are doing is, let me show you this. We're making posters. Okay. You can try to find these. I'll put a few boxes of these around the building. And you can try and find them. There's three of these different posters. Okay. You probably can't see this at the back. This is the campaign for ethical patents. Now, what is this? This is a demand, a, pop a popular demand, for a patent system which actually works. Now, many people may think that the only good patent is a dead patent. You know, we don't want any patents at all. But that's an argument which doesn't work. The, um, there are good reasons for a patent system. They're not very nice, but they're, they're there. Basically, without patents, companies will not publish anything. They, too many secrets, and secrets are bad for collaborative research. So the basic concept of a patent is you publish and you get a small monopoly. The problem is when the monopoly is 20 years long and vast. You know, I own MP3. That just doesn't work anymore. So this, this campaign is designed to ask the question, you know, who, who does the patent system today discriminate against? Why is it bad for open standards, for free software, for small businesses, even for you know, poor people? Why are medicines too expensive? And what do we need, need to do to fix that? There's a website, Ethipat, the campaign for ethical patents. And basically, we want a million signatures. 10 million, hey, a billion signatures, I don't mind, but they've got to be real signatures. And then we will push for a new patent directive in Europe, which will actually define once and for all how the patent system should work, how long a patent should last for, what can be patented, how much it costs, how it happens. So the whole thing, which is now being defined by experts. I say experts, because what they're very good at is Defining systems which make them money and make their friends money, not defining systems which help the common good. And ultimately, every law that we accept has to be a law which is good for all of us. Laws which are unjust and which are good for a few people and bad for everybody else are unethical. I'll finish there and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. If I have 15 minutes every week to dedicate to uh, fighting software attacks, what should I do with my 15 minutes? That's a very good question. It's not enough 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 15 minutes a day might be good. If you want to help right now, just you know, from the buzz of the go to the Ethipad site, try to understand the message and try to get some people to understand the message and spread it around. That's the first thing. If you want to help with the, the patent fight, it is a complicated subject, I'm sorry. Patents are difficult. The delicacies of, of, of the good and the bad are hard to understand. You have to read about it, research. Get involved. You have lots of email lists, lots of wikis, lots of places to get involved. The best thing to do with FYI is to find a local group, national chapter, find out who's in charge, contact them and say, okay, when can I come and meet you? Maybe next month. Maybe try to keep in touch once every couple of months. See when things are happening. 
and discuss by email. That's the simplest. If you have too much money, make us a donation. We're all volunteers. Money helps. Uh, and for the rest, you know, keep keep your ears up, keep involved, keep what's going on. So the new um, the new organisation that they're trying to create to uh, push the patents outside of Europe. Who's that associated with it? Is it associated with the World Trade Organisation? I mean, is it who, where is it being created, and what can be done about it? So this, this new entity which is planned called the European Patent Litigation Agreement, that's the agreement that would create an entity called the European Patent <coughs> Judiciary, which would be basically run under the EPO. So the European Patent Organization runs the European Patent Office, would run also the European Patent Judiciary, would appoint the judges, would basically define the law and also choose people who would then decide on the law for a fixed period of time. It's a completely corrupt concept. Basically, you define the law, you choose your judges, and you say, if you don't implement the law the way I want it, I fire you. It's, it's absolutely amazing. My problem. Can we already join Yesoma? Yes. The website is esoma.org. There's a contact form. We launched this in January, so January 24. I think it was uh, live um, 15 February. It's a Belgian non-profit, so an Asbel, basically, in Belgium. And we are opening the doors today. This is the first public announcement of Esoma, in fact. So you're basically fighting balance. Uh, well, when it uh, want to uh, justify your work, you have to have some examples, some companies, some patterns. Uh, what do you show, like real examples, your real enemies? Uh, what are they? This is one of the problems. These 100,000 software patents sitting at the EPO are all abstract. They're all sitting there. No one quite knows what's patented. So all we have are the, you know, it's like a, a wave, we have just the front of the wave. We definitely see in America the effect of software patents. We see the fact, for example, that software patents make it almost impossible to define new standards safely. So for example, I'm working on a new standard called AMQP, which is a new standard for messaging middleware. It's for high performance communication between systems. We've been working on this for about three years. It's a large effort involving banks, software companies, Cisco, big companies. We cannot publish this without a risk that somebody has patented something in there we don't know. So it's not the tangible, the tangible um, direct damage. I mean, there are good cases. You see, in America, you have cases like BlackBerry paying. $600 million for seven patents. The American system is insane. People will tell you, well, the European system isn't that bad yet, which is true. So in Europe, the problem is still fairly abstract. So what we're mostly confronted by is an intellectual exercise. It's looking at what we have in America, looking at what's already in place in Europe, and then saying, okay, this is where we're going to be. Now, I've been involved in, 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 in the very small number of patent issues in Europe, and they are real. Most of them don't come to court. In fact, it's very rare. The vast majority don't ever even go to a litigation. They simply letters arrive, lawyers knock on the door, and companies say, what is this? What do you mean I'm infringing your patent? And then they settle that they pay. This is a big problem, is that the information on the use of patents in, in, in between companies for Extortion. It's undocumented. There's no data on this. We don't know how many patents are used in Europe. We don't know how much effect they're having right now. So all we can do is extrapolate. And this is one of the difficulties of getting into the debate. It really requires uh, you know, some paranoia and some idea that we're in a, you know, a progression and what's happening in five years time is important, not really what's happening today.
How much time do we have, sir? Five minutes. I just want to say you that the patents really have problems for uh, companies. I am working in a plastic injection molding machine fa uh, fabric and uh, we were attacked by a concurrent. He said it is illegal, I have patented that we use Ethernet in a plastic machinery uh, as injection molds. Okay, so we had to defend. Finally it was declared as non-relevant, but uh, yeah. You have fear, and you don't know whether you can sell in one year or two years the same machines. Thank you. So if you do have concrete cases, please let us know about it. We, we, we do like data. As you say, it's about fear, and it's about risk. And it's about, if you're a small company, how much risk can you, can you afford to take? If you go into a new market and you know that somebody has a patent which hasn't even been defended, but that they're willing to you know, bring out their lawyers, how much risk can you afford to take? And this is also a big difference between Europe and America. In, in America, risk is a, you know, it's a part of life. And people actually, they positively seek risk in some, in some cases. If you go to a venture capitalist and you say, we have this very risky project and they're going to give you more money, not less. But in Europe, you go to a capitalist and say, you have a Zushi project, they say, forget it, we don't like risk. So in the European context, any extra risk is very bad for small companies and very, you know, okay for the larger ones. And this is part of the psychological game. When there are patents in an area, it scares off competition. It lets companies use bluff, which is, of course, no basis for a market. The 100,000 patents you were talking about, are they publicly visible? Is there a database that I could query to see if my product potentially infringes some of these patents? Hmm. Good question. So, we, we do have a website called GAUS which has been working to try to document you know, which are the patents, which are software patents. But there's a big problem with software patents. You know, people don't say, I have patented a table. I'll take Eric Josephson's example here. They, they say, you know, a table with four legs. They say, I've patented a horizontal surface with a number of extrusions per core, you know, at a, an angle which may vary from 10 to 110 degrees perpendicular to the, the surface, which may serve from anything from feet to coffee to plants. They then patent how the table can be made, how it can be sold. And this is a description, a legal document, which is almost impossible to understand. So in fact, you don't know what's patented until you're sued until someone says, this in fact is patented. I saw an example where somebody who had um, invented, I don't know, something very, something like a remote control, has now suing someone for uh, electronic music distribution, saying this is the same thing. And if you look at the patent description, it could plausibly overlap. So a, a good patent lawyer, a person who makes your, your patent for you, will make the software patent as any patent, in fact, as, as broad and as vague and as fuzzy as possible. And there's no, there's no pressure on, on, the, on the claimant to make quality patents on our big progress. So for us, the, the conclusion right now is these software patents may not become legal instruments. They must be kept out of the market, period. When there's a better system, we could possibly allow some kind of a claim on some aspects of, of the work. So very, very, very well controlled. Okay, that's all for now. I'll be around for a little while, so if you have questions, come to me afterwards. Thank you very much.